Bom dia a todos, muito obrigada pela presença de vocês na terceira edição da nossa Global Managers Conference, principal evento da área de distribuição de terceiros do BTG Pactual, onde nós reunimos os melhores gestores globais. O tema de hoje será a alocação global de ativos. Para este painel, nós convidamos o Luca Paulini, estrategista-chefe da PICT, gestora suíça que possui mais de 200 anos de história e gere mais de 183 bilhões de dólares e o Rob Almeida, estrategista de investimentos globais da MFS, gestora americana, fundada em 1924, que gere mais de 450 bilhões de dólares. Para moderar esse painel, nós convidamos o Stefan Corsaletti, CIO da Alfans. Muito obrigada, e agora eu passo a palavra para o Stefan. Stefan. Good morning, uh, everyone, and I'm very pleased to... Uh, Welcome you on this uh, first day of the uh, Global Managers Conference uh, for this session dedicated to uh, global asset allocation. Well, this is always a fascinating subject and even more so uh, today when the major stock uh, market are close to their record levels and interest rates are close to zero, uh, which should make us wonder about the temptation to keep our current investment exposure or to stop taking profit. But in that case, where to redeploy, on which asset classes redeploy these, uh, these profits. Uh, before starting this session, I would like to remind all participants that they can intervene uh, via the dialog uh, box that should appear on the right hand side of their screen. And I will try to pass on the, uh, the questions to, uh, to, 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 our, skipper, uh, to our speakers. Uh, but after these uh, housekeeping remarks, we can start our session. And I would suggest that we start with the macroeconomic uh, environment, uh, the analysis of which naturally uh, underpins any investment decision. So where are we with the growth and inflation in the major region of the world? Uh, we are obviously uh, seeing a steeper than expected economic uh, upturn. Uh, do you see this upturn uh, only as a counterpart to the drop uh, experienced during the pandemic, uh, which can only uh, fade by the beginning of 22, or as a more sustainable growth trend facilitated by the uh, low interest rate environment and the huge budget packages Such, one, such as the one agreed uh, last week in the US. So gentlemen, what's your opinion about growth? Luca, would you like to, to start on this topic? Yeah, first of all, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Good morning. Um, yeah, I think it's, um, it's fair to say this has been, uh, of course, uh, a very unusual recession and we are seeing a very unusual recovery. I think is is we are in a way in an accelerated business cycle, accelerated on the way down and the way up. Even if the general 
pattern of uh, recession recovery is pretty much in place. I have to say what is new, what is different this time is that, as you said, Stefan, is we have seen an incredible amount of fiscal stimulus. We are talking about 16% of GDP in developed markets, 4% in EM, according to the IMF. is a huge number. It will not go away. And so I think it's fair to say that we believe that we are in a strong, solid um, upturn, which is, I don't think is incredibly dependent from low level of bond yields or interest rates. I think the market maybe is, but the economy, I think, a pretty solid foundation, as long as, of course, we are able to manage the pandemic well, that we are improving the vaccination rollout. And I think the challenge that we have is inflation, probably we'll discuss about this later on. But otherwise, we believe in this recovery, I think is solid, and it will last definitely a couple of years, but we are in an accelerated business cycle. We have to keep this in mind. Thank you, Luca. Rob, would you like to add something about the growth environment and, and potentially its impact on the inflation prospects? Sure. At, at least for me, the, the way I think about the last 18 months in, in simple terms is this was an incomplete cycle, right? The economy uh, fell by 30 percent, right? It fell by a third, yet so it was five times bigger than your normal recession. But we escaped out of it, which you alluded to in your question, uh, five times or excuse me, four times faster than any other recession. And it was um, the reasons why and, and Luca highlighted, it, which is is stimulus. So, you know, the job of a recession is to effectively metaphorically wash away the excesses or what was wrong in the past cycle. And that didn't happen. Right, so corporations had too much debt, demographics were poor, and digitalization was having a deflationary uh, impact on, on the world for the last six, seven, eight years. So none of those things went away. And so because of the stimulus and the recovery, you're getting huge GDP lift, which you highlighted, huge inflation lift. But I think ultimately that's transitory. Once the sugar high of the stimulus fades, then you're back to all those same problems we had before the pandemic hit. So basically, Rob, this means that in our view, the uh, current inflation bubble that we that we see, which is uh, which is substantial again, uh, as we have seen with the last uh, well core CPI figures for the month of May in the U.S., yeah. which, if I remember well, are the highest for uh, almost 30 years. Yeah. So, in your view, it's it's a very short term impact of this uh, well strong growth upturn, but you do not expect this as a as a long lasting trend so you you believe that on the inflation side we we could come back to normal and and before you answer this question i would like to raise the importance of this topic because in case you know the the, the, the growth start fading away beginning of 22 uh in if we would keep this uh, abnormal level of inflation this could create a squeeze in uh, in profit margins and therefore have an impact on the on the stock markets yeah i i think the simplest way to think about it without a uh commensurate growth in wages or real income, ultimately inflation is a tax. It's going to create demand destruction. So right now, one out of every $5 of income in the United States, as a for instance, is from government transfer payments, aka stimulus, unemployment benefits, uh, the stimulus checks, etc. And so right now, people can afford to take their family to Disney World, uh, rebuild their back deck, and buy a used car, and then maybe a boat too. They're not going to be able to do all those things in six to nine months. They're going to have to make a choice. Now, you are seeing wage growth. I mean, my 17-year-old son, his greatest skill is lying to his father, right? So he's making an unusual uh, amount in his summer job uh, at a restaurant, but I think when those unemployment benefits fade and those people are forced back to work this fall, you're just not going to have the type of uh, wage growth 
to uh, sustain these inflationary pressures that you're seeing. So I think they fade. So Luca, do you, do you share this uh, this point of view, which would be well nice for the financial market perspective? Huh? So uh, inflation coming back to uh, let's say normal level after this uh, this recent hike. So just a temporary uh, move. Well, first of all, let me say that this is not a base effect. So there is still this discussion: is is temporary is a base effect? It may be temporary, but it's not a base effect. If you look at the index level, we are one percent above the index level. So it's definitely not a base effect. If it's temporary or not, I think Rob is right, will depend on the growth outlook. There is no inflation, I think, without growth. And I'm afraid, Rob is right, I think the level of stimulus is so big that it's very difficult to measure the impact because it is true that the stimulus will probably fade. But in the US, and by the way, we shouldn't just talk about the US because there are different economies. In the US, we have two trillion of excess savings. And the jury is out on will people in the US spend these savings or not? Our view on inflation is this, that we are going to have a decline in inflation next six months because of, uh, I think, more people will join the labor force because, because also the economy will fade a little bit in terms of growth. But there will be a second wave in inflation next year, which will be much more dangerous. Because this would be, I think, this the uh, consequence of wage growth, so lower margins, and the market may be taken by surprise. So I, I'm much more worried about the potential second wave of inflation next year, based on this kind of lag impact on demand, than what we are seeing now, which I think could be seen as temporary. But it's the second wave that I think it can make a huge difference. And I, I believe the uh, monetary authorities are actually uh, sharing the same concern. And uh, uh, after what the uh, Fed uh, well, official said two weeks ago, uh, w what's your view on the uh, tapering process over the next uh, next months and uh, and your expectation uh, of uh, the monetary, U.S. monetary policy? Uh, do you think that they, they are going to anticipate the the hike, maybe? earlier than they said two weeks ago could be uh, uh, could, could that start in 22 for example inst instead of 23 i mean okay i can answer i i think you know when we look at the history of the fed titan phases there is uh, an interesting pattern that always repeats itself investors are expecting a rate hike that always earlier than is actually happens and but then they expect us very slow tightening Phase. So this has been the mistake of the last five cycles. And uh, I suspect that the market may do a similar mistake this time. I don't think that the Fed will be in any hurry to hike, but I also think that when they start hiking, they will hike probably more than expected. And so I think from my point of view, I think uh, a rate hike in at the end of 2022 is probably possible, which is already priced in. The taper thing, Honestly, I think it's all priced in. I don't think it makes a huge difference. I don't think that Fed would make, let's say, a taper tantrum mistake. But I think they are massively behind the curve. They know that. Uh, at the end, you know, when you look at the shadow of Fed fund rate, so if you take into consideration uh, also the QE, we are a minus 6%. This is the effective real Fed fund rate. When an economy that is running at 10%, they're obviously behind the curve. So they have to close the gap. They have started. But I think it's not going to be disruptive for markets. That would be my 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 expectation. Rob, I'm I'm sure that from Boston you are a Fed watcher. What's your what's your view on the monetary policy? Well, I I, I think, and I'll maybe answer a little bit differently. I think, or I fear, we have a new generation of investors. Those that started in financial services post 2008, so probably a third, that have been trained by the markets to believe that central banks can create wealth. They can create money, but they can't create wealth. And those are two different things. And so, a hundred and let's see, five years ago now, when the Fed was created, the first Fed chairman said, We will never have. Uh, recession again. And so <laughs> Luke mentioned history repeats itself. Fed paternalism uh, is a thing that creates moral hazard, if you will. So at some point, 
the Fed's balance sheet, which went from four trillion, which was too much to begin with, to eight trillion now, or to put it in this context, global central banks have bought over a billion dollars of financial assets every hour over the last 15 months. That isn't investing, right? Investing is in people funding projects, people funding initiatives that have uh, uh, a rate of return that's going to exceed the cost of capital. And so at some point, water will find its right level. And when the market starts looking forward and discounting that unwind of those balance sheets, whether it comes earlier or later, I think you're going to have assets that uh, their valuation will not, uh, their fundamentals won't support their valuation. I'll answer it that way. Yeah, moreover, this is not something specific to the U.S. Federal Reserve. So in, uh, in, right. in the major region, so central banks have the same policy and therefore, uh, so ev everyone is, is looking how to, we, we're going to exit from this, uh, from such a situation. And, and of course, it's going to have an impact on the, uh, on the exchange rate. So, uh, Luca, what's your view on the uh, U.S. dollar uh, against the major currencies? First of all, let me say that uh, on, on the Fed that though, uh, uh, in our view, the Fed is important. Uh, Rob is right, of course, everybody is watching the Fed. But there is another chart that doesn't change in 15 years. What matters for bull market is not the Fed, it's the US economy. So actually what we, I think what we have to do as investors is instead of being obsessed by the Fed, is to look at the data. At some point when the economy will weaken, this will be the time to say, okay, enough is enough. Before that, I don't want to say you cannot fight the Fed because you can and sometimes you succeed. I think, though, it's all about the U.S. economy. This will determine where the markets will go. On the dollar, we are very bearish in the long term for a very simple reason. Ask yourself the questions. In the past, there has been a few currencies that have been structurally strong. Think about the Swiss franc or back then the Deutsche Mark. Why? Fiscal responsibility, productivity growth is as simple as that. And I think Rob is right. You can print money as much as you want, but if you print money, you print dollars, you don't want to have dollars in your pockets. That's common sense. So do I see a big pickup in productivity in the US? I don't. Maybe we will see, but I don't see it. The Fed itself, they publish a lot of stuff saying they don't see an increase in productivity. That's even before COVID. And if you look at the um, fiscal and monetary policy, well, I can mention just one statistics. The twin deficit of the US, so current account deficit, budget deficit is the worst of any, any, any market, DM and yet. So to me, it's uh, you have to be, I think, bearish on the dollar. But short term, you look at the alternatives and you have Europe in this situation, Japan struggling with the pandemic. And, and so probably tactically, we are a little bit kind of l more balanced, but strategically, we're still very short the dollar and the dollar will depreciate, especially against emerging Asia currency where the fundamentals are very strong. Okay, so now coming to the financial markets. So you, you would agree that uh, investors' asset allocation decisions are particularly uh, tricky by these times because they, they have the choice between the uh, near zero rate on the fixed income side and super stretch valuation or let's say stretch valuation on the equity side. How can they overcome such a dilemma when building a portfolio? Does it mean that the historical, you know, 60, 40 model portfolio way of thinking is, uh, is obsolete? Luca uh, or Rob? Uh, okay. Okay. I can you take that. Okay. Or oh, Rob, you want to, you want to, no, you go ahead. You go ahead. Rob. Sure. Well, I, I'm not sure if the 60, 40 model, um, will work or, or won't work. I don't think of it in those terms. I, I think of it in, in terms of risk premia broadly. So uh, if we just think of terms of your compensation for risk, whether it's in credits, whether it's in sovereign bonds, whether it's in equities, large, small, US, non-US, risk premia is low worldwide and it's lower in certain areas than it is in, in, in others. But I, I think in terms of just paradigms. So each business cycle for the last 40 years was lower in its rate of growth than the one prior. As a result, interest rates went lower in each new business cycle. So you had lower highs and lower, lower lows and risk premia continued to fall. So stock prices, bond price ultimately follow 
margins and in, in, in profit strength. So I guess when I think about it, looking out over the next, not one year, but five years, 10 years, perhaps even, even 20 years, we've had uh, an environment of uh, shareholder primacy where companies extracted as much economic rent as possible, whether it's from the climate or from bondholders or from other stakeholders, to drive margins to where they were pre-pandemic at all-time highs, literally all-time highs, despite significantly below average economic growth. So how do you reconcile those two things? So I guess what I would offer is looking forward against a backdrop of very tight risk premia, against a, a backdrop where I think the levers to um, duplicate that type of margin profile aren't going to be there any longer. Market The returns for just generic market beta are going to be lower. So I think it's going to be really critical for a 50-50 portfolio, 60-40, 70-30, whatever that mix looks like, the, the guts, what you have inside it, the security selection or that alpha component is going to be a much larger determinant of total return looking out, whether it's 60-40 or 70-30 or something like that. Security selection is going to be a lot more important than I think it has been. Do, 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 you, do you mean that the uh, active versus passive debate is somewhat less important nowadays than it was over the last uh, two, three years uh, with uh, more let's stock selection driving the performance rather than pure beta exposure? I, I think so, and I'll just classify it as the importance of mistake avoidance is going to take a step function change up. I guess when I think about investing, it's super simple, but incredibly hard. It's all about cash flows. And when there's an abundance of cash flows, like there's been for 10 plus years, actually more like 40 years, right? When there's abun an abundance of ROA, ROE, ROI, EBITDA, whatever metric you want to use, it's easy. It doesn't really matter what you buy, everything is going up. But if that error is going the other way, or at the very least hard to duplicate, and you have more companies with a falling margin profile or falling ROE or falling ROA, whatever that metric will look like, the importance of security selection should matter immensely more, particularly avoiding those franchises that are melting ice cubes or melting icebergs. And that's where I think Active uh, will do far, far better than it has over the last 10, 15 years. Luca, what's your view on this very important uh, topic? So portfolio construction, standard model, active versus passive. Uh, how do you deal with these uh, uh, topics at, at Big Day? Well, look, I mean, if you look at a 50-50, the last 10, 10 years has been fantastic, right? Because you had superior returns, negative correlation between equities and bonds, so low risk, higher returns, and we know why. The problem is that historically, when you have a 50-50 portfolio, your return is normally twice as much as the initial yield. The initial yield now, in real terms, is almost zero. Actually, if you look at 50-50 portfolio. So on a, in our forecast, we have 1.5% real return per annum of a global 50-50 portfolio. And the long-term average is five. So how do you get to this 1.5 to five? Selection is very important. But I think there are two key aspects that we focus on big tech. I think what you shouldn't do, I think, is just to have a 50-50 that you rebalance once a year. Again, this has been working very well in the past. It's not going to help in the future. So what we do is the following. On one side, we try to be more tactical. So try to change the asset. And it's not easy. Change your asset location more often. You know, you follow your technical uh, valuation, macroeconomic models. This is one thing. The second one, if anything, is to do the opposite. You extend your investment horizon so far away in the future to capture the secular growth, because the cyclical growth is probably not going to be great. The secular growth is there, and we think about Asia is an obvious one. So that's why we focus on one side on tactical allocation, on the other side on, on growth or investment teams that we know will give it additional, additional return. You know, obviously climate change is an obvious one, robotics, I can give you some examples. So we do this barber strategy, shorter term tactical, 
and very long term in, in, in terms of teams. And I think the passive 50 50, I think, is not going to help you given the, where we are in terms of valuation. Well, it seems that uh, investors truly believe in this uh, thematic approach to uh, to investing. Uh, let me share with you a, a figures that I uh, extracted from our uh, platform from Telemetrics at All Funds. Uh, year to date, uh, we have seen that sectors and themes uh, represent 40% of the uh, equity fund flow. Okay, so this is the biggest contributor, and it's it's probably the first time we have seen this uh, this kind of outcome. So there is clearly a, a major interest from investor for this trend approach, very long term. Uh, where is the secular growth? Is it coming from aging population? Is it coming from uh, nutrition and healthcare, etc.? So. I guess that it's something that you, you do see as well in your both organization. So I picked that, I already know the answer at, M at MFS, uh, Rob. Sure, I guess I'll, I'll answer it in this way. It's always dangerous as an investor to confuse science in the commercial application of the science. So what I think you tend to see throughout history is investors get very exercised or very enthusiastic about a theme without truly uh, analyzing appropriately what's the commercial um, application or commercial potential of the theme and is it priced into the asset? So look at 3D printing as an example, a, a tremendous science, a tremendous technology, but one that has not been successful from a margin standpoint at the commercial level, because it's hard to differentiate between one 3D printer and another. Um, same thing you're seeing with cryptocurrencies, tremendous enthusiasm, and I don't disagree with the science, I don't disagree with the value proposition, what I disagree with is the valuation or the, 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 the commercial, uh, the cash flow uh, analysis that investors are, are applying. So whether it's robotics or um, uh, other sciences like EV or autonomous cars, as a citizen, I'm enthusiastic about these. But as an investor, I need to understand two things. One, what will be the commercial application of it? And then two, who will the Starbucks or the Apple, who, who will be the uh, margin owner? What company has a differentiated product within that science that affords them pricing power and ultimately a margin profile that will be superior to the market? So that's, I guess, from an investing standpoint, how I think about those areas. And can, can we say that going forward, the financial markets will combine the very short term bets from the Robin Hood investors with the very long term trend identified on the, you know, the secular uh, growth, uh, growth trend that we mentioned before? Is it something like this, you know, a, a, a long term trend with uh, volatility uh, caused by the, uh, the, the short term traders? Well, I, I don't know if this answers your question, but yesterday, um, my family and I, to uh, escape the extreme heat that we're having here in the Boston area, went to a movie theater. And I haven't been to a movie theater in you know a, a couple of years at, at least. And AMC, so a, a Reddit stock, right, uh, a Robin Hood stock that was a sub one billion market cap company. Um, as the pandemic was unfolding, and now it's a 25 billion market cap. So what's the market implying? The market is implying that every AMC movie theater will be sold out, every one, for the next 10 years. Every seat within each movie played all day long will, will consume $100 of popcorn and candy and drinks and things like that. And yesterday, I think there was me and about 15 other people there. So I, I think um, you have a, a group of investors today with uh, a lot of cash, thanks to the government, um, technology, which reduced the barriers to entry and bought cash commissions to zero. And you now have a non-sophisticated investor that's using cashless 
or excuse me, commissionless trading and actually gamma. Over 50% of the option volume in the market is small. I I've never seen anything like this. So I think there's a little bit of too much enthusiasm in some of these areas. Well, absolutely. And one of the major topics of the uh, last uh, six to eight months since we uh, since uh, some, we discovered the vaccine uh, is the rotation uh, in favor of value against mm -hmm. growth. And so it's, it becomes a little bit more bumpy since uh, since one month. What What's your view on this? Do you think that uh, uh, it's time, it's still time to, to come back to uh, value investing? What, what's your, your policy in that regard? I think as an industry, we love to overcomplicate investing as, as much as we can. And, and we dissect it and, and break it down. Uh, in, in partition it, such as value or, or, or growth. And I, under, I understand why. To me, the answer or the best way to think about value versus growth or growth versus value is where are and what will interest rates be? That's it. So in the post GFC business cycle where growth was outperforming value, Uh, the media and market participants were assigning the attribution to FANG stocks. And yeah, that, that was part of it, but, but why? Well, what was happening is growth stocks have scarcity value because there's no growth. So the equity market for years up until the pandemic was telling you there's no economic growth. It doesn't matter what central banks are doing. They can't create growth. And that's why growth outperformed value. Now, fast forward through the pandemic, as value has massively outperformed growth, it's the inverse of that. Because of the stimulus and the reopening, those two things combined, you're going to get a huge step function, 8, 9, 10% GDP growth, highest inflation, which you highlight, highlighted earlier in 30 years. It's, it's natural or it makes total sense for value to outperform growth in that sort of environment. So I think at least for me looking forward, it really comes down to what do you believe the terminal value is for interest rates and the economy? And so I think, I don't know when, but maybe it's in 2022, maybe it's not till later when that stimulus fades and GDP decelerates and finds its steady state value. I think you'll see a lot of that value versus growth uh, imbalance go away. Luca, what's your opinion on this important topic? Well, my opinion is that uh, what we have learned from the last six months is that uh, when we look at value versus growth, basically you're looking for, let's say, banks versus tech. Let's keep it very simple. So questions. Uh, do you like a Euro regional European banks more than, let's say, Amazon? I'll put Amazon as IT or, or, or Microsoft. Well, over the long term, I would say no way. Um, I wouldn't put, let's say, all my pension funds in European regional banks. But in the short term, we have to be very aware of the fact that La Cia for tech was, you know, for most of us was, of course, a very distressing period, difficult for tech. They were incredibly lucky because basically what happened, you have a lot of people stay at home. Obviously, you have a huge update, upgrade in terms of IT equipment, people having money, obviously Amazon, you know the story. But this was based on, for a lot of people were obviously incredibly bad luck. It was a terrible time, but for tech was effectively luck. And now what we are seeing is part of this luck is actually now being kind of priced out because we are kind of hopefully going back to normal. And if you're going back to normal, what was suffering before is doing better now. It's as simple as that. Again, this is tactical versus strategic. Strategically, we like tech. Tactically, if, if hopefully the vaccination goes well, you actually want to buy what is, let's say, bad, or what you will not normally think about to buy. Like, let's say, European banks is a typical example. And I don't think this, this will change soon because the vaccination is doing well, interest rates are moving higher. I think there will be a time probably next year when all these trends will reverse. And then the quality of this kind of big tech companies will reemerge. For now, I think there is still a lot of um, upside for value. Uh, but again, that's tactically. Strategy is a completely different environment where we still retain a big overweight in tech over the long term. Thank you. And taking the market as a whole, uh, so having in mind the uh, S&P 500, so 
I think that we are close to 35 in terms of uh, P ratio. Uh, what's your opinion on this figure? Would you say that the, the, the market is uh, massively overvalued? How would you qualify this, uh, this uh, level of uh, valuation? And are there uh, some, some sector, uh, some stocks that in this context are still relatively cheap? So we mentioned value, but we can be more granular and uh, we, can, we can mention some, some sectors if you wish. Uh, sure, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Um, so I think it's extremely e expensive. Um, you know, that said, when you consider in the context of where interest rates are, particularly real rates at negative 1%, it's not as expensive as where it was in the late 90s, but it is the second highest valuation uh, in a century and a half. I mean, it's higher than where it was uh, going into uh, the Great Depression. And so I, I think what central banks have, have done, obviously it's, it's fueled that. Um, and I, I, I guess for me, uh, when I think about sectors or areas that are relatively attractive within that, it would be global uh, dividend paying equities. This is probably the only asset class where valuations aren't as unreasonable as they are in other areas at 13, 14, 15 times with a three to 4% uh, dividend yield. Um, within that, also REITs, uh, whether U.S. REITs or global REITs, they're not as cheap, but they're comprised of hard assets that pay a relatively high coupon, so it's a, a low duration equity. Um, and as the world uh, reopens, a lot of those cash flows uh, come back online. And I think a lot of investors mistakenly think of that universe as this homogenous group of stocks where it's just malls and, and stores or shopping centers. And that's not the case. It's, it's data centers, it's apartments, it's facilities for biotech research, it's fulfillment centers for you know, the Amazons and, and, and e-commerces of, of the world. Um, so those are a couple of areas that uh, I think offer some relative value within a expensive equity world. Luca, your view on market valuation and the remaining opportunities in this context? Well, I think I agree on the fact that valuation are expensive. I have to say is, Rob is right, is about the real rates. And, you know, on our analysis is that if you have real rates at zero, the P, the fair value of the S&P would be 80. Now, if you look at a 12 months forward P, which is now close to 22, is it a huge overvaluation? Probably not. But again, you have to make assumptions. here. So what the market is telling us is that bond yields will remain low forever and growth will be strong forever. Is it a realistic assumption? No. That's why when you look back of the past, let's say, 40 years, what really matters for future performance, interesting enough, is not necessarily the equity risk premium. It's actually the level of PEs. So if you just look at the level of P now and you look at the performance of the next six, six, uh, 10 years, it's actually a pretty good fit. So I think that personally what is scary about valuation is that market is pricing in, again, low interest rates forever, high growth, and margins continue to rise even if, even if clearly corporate taxation is changing. Maybe we're going to discuss about this. Corporate taxation has been falling for a long time, for 20 years. And in our analysis, one third of the increase in saving in, in, in margins has been from lower taxation. This is turning, which costs, which costs are rising. So I think that if you put everything together, the market is expensive. But again, as long as the US economy is doing well, I don't think you should be worried. But when the market starts to go down, this valuation will be a big problem. But I think we're not there. Okay, so coming to uh, to fixed income, so how to to build this uh, side of a diversified portfolio? 
So we have still negative rates in Europe. We are close to 1.5 in the US. Uh, so typically, the, the fixed income side of a, of a multi-asset portfolio is there to amortize the fluctuation, to decorrelate uh, to some extent the two sides of the portfolio. How is it, how it is possible, possible to reach such an objective in, in, in the current context? And what sh shall we keep some exposure to to uh, government bonds with uh, such l very low yields, does it still make sense? And how to replace the remaining part of a, of a fixed income portfolio? Because of course, the, the risk is to try, you know, seeking higher yield, but in doing this, you would re-correlate your fixed income side with your equity side and create probably a super volatile uh, solution at the end. Okay, I can go. I think the, the worst we can do as investors is exactly to chase higher yields uh, at any cost. And, you know, typically this phase of the cycle should be ideal for credit. If you look at the, uh, the past three recession in the US, we look at Europe, we look at the performance of credit over equities in the two years after the recession, credit has done better. So this should be actually the best time to buy credit. There is one problem that this time the, um, the yield that you get from, from equities and the high yield that you can get on corporate bonds is basically the same. So the valuation this is a one case where the valuation matters. If you want to take risk, take risk in equities and not in credit. Your question on government bonds, you still need to have government bonds. You can be based in US, Japan, or Europe. You need to have US treasury bonds. You always need to have treasury bonds. Our, our point though, if you start from a 50-50, our location to bond strategically is probably around 25, and of these 25, more than half actually would be on tips and Chinese bonds, which in our view is the new safe haven asset class. So we have almost nothing in Europe. We have some treasury bonds, mainly tips and Chinese government bonds. And everything else for us is really, you are almost guaranteed to lose money, which is not the best, I think, uh, proposition for an investor. So we stay away from that. And, and what's your view, Rob? Would you build the fixed income side in the same way or would you uh, suggest to, to include some, some alternative investment in, the, in your client's portfolio? Yeah, I agree with Luca. And, and maybe let me offer this for, for context. Um, the last 40 years have been so anomalous that I, I don't think investors appreciate, particularly the, the newer, younger ones, just how unique this has been. So for the last four decades, you had collapsing risk premium in equities and in fixed income with negative correlation. It doesn't get much better than that. I would imagine in 30 years, 50 years, 100 years, textbooks, uh, or what they teach in, in finance, they'll use this as some sort of golden era. Um, when you look back in, at, say, uh, UK bonds, so compare gilts and UK equities, so you can go back uh, close to 400 years and look at this, the correlation between equities and bonds are actually positive. And you can do it for U.S. treasuries and U.S. stocks, not obviously going as far back, but 150 years, the correlation is positive. It's only been in the last 30, 40 years where you've had this massive secular decline in rates for reasons we talked about, where you had um, positive performance with negative correlation. And so for investors looking out, uh, they need to be very, very careful. And if they're increasing their credit book, then perhaps they should be decreasing risk in their equity book. Because at the end of the day, there's only one asset class. And it's called volatility. And you're either short it or you're long it. And so as these things mean revert and have a correlation of one, you need government bonds in that portfolio because it's the only thing that's really going to give you that gamma um, and you're going to want that. Absolutely. So uh, government bonds are a kind of ballast in a submarine. So you absolutely <laughs> <laughs> need this kind of uh, instrument. Uh, by the way, I can see that there is a question from the audience, uh, which is a good transition to my next topic, because I would like to uh, 
talk about uh, alternatives and to, to, to get your views on how to, to, to use alternative and which asset class in the global alternative space you would recommend. It's, it's a question about gold and, and precious metals. Uh, what, what role do you see for gold in a, in a globally diversified portfolio? And maybe you can you can also uh, well consider the 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 decorrelation between gold and cryptocurrencies, which is an interesting phenomenon that I would like to to get your 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 point of view on. Uh, okay, I can I can get this. Um, I think when you look at gold, we have been uh, structurally um, positive on gold for a long time. Uh, put it in very simple terms: gold is a function of two things the dollar and real rates. Now you can imagine that we expect real rates to remain negative, wrongly in a way, but that's will remain negative. The dollar to be weaker. So gold for us continues to be an asset class that we have. And you know, we have uh, in our kind of uh, sacred art, we say 5% um, weight in gold makes sense. You know, 5% seems small, but I can tell you most investors have zero. So again, the combination of inflation risks, weaker dollar, um, to, to me is, is still suggesting a strong performance of, um, of gold. Having said that, tactically, the situation is very different because the worst possible environment for gold is when you have a US economy going back to normal with some kind of normalization of rates. So in the short term, I think gold will struggle. In the long term, the case for gold continue to be as strong as ever. And we still like, we have been liking gold for the past 10 years and we continue to do so for the future. So no change for us. C can't we say that gold is an asset class suitable to mature investors when the, the, the younger investor, the kind of Robin Hood investor would prefer cryptocurrencies? Is it a relevant parallel? I, 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 think, I think this debate about digital gold is clearly there. I, again, I see the cryptocurrency more like a lottery ticket. You may win, but your probability of winning is so low that I wouldn't bother it. But I, I, I think is is the reason why investors and investing in cryptocurrency are actually not too far away from the idea of investing in gold. But yeah, it's it's more, let's say, is the new generation probably see uh, cryptocurrency as as digital gold. We don't, but I, I can I can see why this may be the case. The one the one thing that I find strange about the parallel that the crypto bulls are, are uh, making as it pertains to gold is that it's the substitute for fiat currency. So I, I understand that, but crypto, and to me, this is the bear case, not again, not from its usage standpoint. I think that's, that's viable and it's, and it's here to stay, but from an investing standpoint, because it's infinitely divisible. And so how do you invest in something that's infinitely divisible? I, 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 just, I honestly just struggle with that. So gold's not divisible. There's not going to be Almeda gold or Luca gold or Stefan gold, but there can be Almeda uh, digital FX or Amazon FX or Alibaba coin. Or, so uh, the infinite divisibility of cryptocurrency, to me, uh, I struggle with how that is a uh, in asset class and and regarding the the, the more traditional uh, alternative asset classes i mean uh, private assets and hedge funds uh, what's the well the, the the strategic allocation you 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 propose to your clients i think i think from from our point of view when we look at the secular auto that we have we see good value in property direct property we see good value in gold um, I think that private equities should do well, but probably that you won't make the usual premium that you get. You know, you, I think if you invest in private equities, you probably expect 5%. I think you're going to get probably less. This is an asset class that I think obviously is based on leverage. Uh, that is low interest rates will remain low, but not as low as probably they have been. Taxation is an issue as well. So I think that you will still uh, perform um, public equities, but probably not by much. Edge funds, you mentioned edge funds. I think in a situation where you have a lot of um, overvaluation, uh, stock selection is important. I think edge funds can do actually quite well. And actually, we use edge funds, and I think 
more as a substitute for bonds. So as a kind of a cash equivalent, since so they use market neutral funds as cash equivalents or in substitution of bonds. You're not gonna make 10% per annum, but you're gonna make very good risk adjusted returns at a time where it's gonna be very difficult to achieve that. So these are the three areas that we look at. Yeah, and, and, and for us, we don't provide advice in that form where you, know, you should own X percent of this or, or Y percent of that. I just would caution investors with um, looking at historical returns and, and drawing up a correlation matrix. So just because uh, a private equity book or private credit book is not mark to mark on a daily basis doesn't mean it has a, a lower correlation. And so if we just keep it simple as an investor, whether an asset is public or private, you're funding a project. So to me, what's more important than the label, right? If it's growth or if it's value or if it's global or international, U.S. on U.S. large, small, public or private, what's more important is what's underneath the hood and is the business viable? Does it offer a sustainable value proposition to society that's going to derive a stream of cash flows that's going to uh, be better than the alternatives? If so, whether it's public or private, it's going to be a good investment. I have a last topic for you guys before we come to a conclusion and open the Q&A session. It's about ESG, because like other uh, pre-existing uh, structural trends, it seems that the pandemic has accelerated everywhere in the world the uh, transition to sustainability. What, what, what's your view on this and how? Uh, what are the consequences in the way you build your portfolio? I'll go first. Me, I, I think it's massive. And I don't want to say it's the least talked about because obviously ESG is a major topic, but I think it's the least that they're talking about the wrong thing. To me, ESG, it's an input. It's not an output. So you have a lot of organizations today that are marketing ESG as an output, whereas in reality, many of these sustainable inputs are hard to measure. They're not things that you can easily capture in a spreadsheet or in a model. And in fact, these are the things that can blow a hole through a business and it's really hard to model that. And so I guess the way I, I think about it, you mentioned uh, the pandemic pulled it forward. It absolutely did. One out of every three dollars that's gone into global equity um, assets this year has been branded as something ESG. But to me, the reason it's important is, you know, we don't live in a partial equilibrium world. We live in a general equilibrium world. So if you're going to tell a company that they need to operate differently, whether it's a politician, a regulator, or an investor that's forcing a company to change and operate more sustainably, it's going to be inflationary to CapEx or inflationary to OpEx or both. And it's probably going to be deflationary to margin. And so to me, it's so important to make sure we understand what these impacts will be to the income statement for every company looking out because you have some companies that have been already operating in an appropriate or a sustainable way and their margins will be fine and you've got other companies that are now playing catch up and i'm willing to bet that their margin profile over the last 10 years will look much lower over the next 10 probably because their product or their service just isn't good enough Luca, how do you address this major shift at uh, Big Tech? Yeah, well, I, I think when you look at SG, whatever you think is is a real fact, is a, is, is a huge fact. And I can tell you when me clients a few years ago, nobody was asking about ESG, uh, apart from maybe the Netherlands and Scandinavia, no one. Now is actually, is not the first question, it's the second. I think there are two issues. First of all, I think for us, ESG will make, will uh, be as powerful as a force as the shift from active to passive. So it's secular, it's massive, and you can fight against it. You may like it or not, but you cannot fight. And there are two elements, as Rob said, one on the earnings. And this, you have to be obviously very selective. Some companies will benefit, some companies obviously will lose of that. 
there is also an element of demand. The companies that, that are scoring well for whatever reason, whatever metrics, they will trade as they are now a significant premium. We may debate if it's right or wrong, but this is, I think, customer driven. And then there is a final element that we are trying now to do it right now in our, in our kind of asset allocation is how this can affect even traditional allocation decisions. I can give an example. Europe scores way, way better than the US in terms of EIG. Emerging market don't. Are you looking at where we are now? So if you look where we are now, Europe should trade a significant amount to the US, which is not the case. We tend to look more at the progression, the improvements. Asia is a typical example. Asia is lagging, but it's actually closing the gap, we think. So, it, it, you know, there are a lot of factors. And look, ESG is here to stay. You cannot find the trend, whatever whatever you think about it. And obviously, a big day, like I think most of our competitors, we are taking notes and we are, again, even changing the allocation process to adjust for, 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 for the ESG uh, element right now. Thank you, Luca. So we are close to the end. So I think it's time to, to open the, the Q&A. So I would like to remind you that you can uh, ask your question into the into the chat box on the, the right hand side of your screen. Th there is already uh, one question about the uh, well, the local asset classes, the Brazilian asset classes. What are the consequences of this uh, global analysis, this global frame that we discussed uh, together for, for local asset classes and, and more particularly the, the real versus the dollar? Luca, okay. would you like to take that one? Yeah, when we look at the, well, I think I have to say that on our evaluation metric, it looks incredibly cheap. We are talking about two standard deviation cheap. And, you know, it's not Latin American in general because the Mexican peso look pretty much in line with fundamentals. If you look at Brazilian equities, 40% discount to, to EMM. And you start to think, well, this is at the end, Brazil, especially Latin America, is mainly value, commodity driven should do much, much better. So why, why this, honestly, this gap is unprecedented between commodity prices or value versus growth and, and Latin America, why? Because of fiscal risk. And you, I think the audience know much better than me what I'm talking about. And obviously uh, the pandemic. I think for us, we still like Brazilian and Mexican bond over the long term. On the equity side, we have a strong preference for Asia because you have, at the end of the day, you pay more, but I think there is much more earnings visibility, much more growth, much less political risk in Asia. So we like bonds, especially local currency bonds in Brazil and Mexico. We prefer emerging market Asian um, equities. And I have to say, tactically, I think when the COVID pandemic is behind us, hopefully sooner rather than later, let's say the end of this year, I think that for Latin America, we are great buying opportunity in almost all asset classes, but that's more tactical. Strategic, we like local currency bonds, especially in Mexico and Brazil, and we expect the Brazilian real to appreciate in the long term. Thank you, Luca, for your concluding remarks. Uh, Rob, would you like to say something about your best picks for the, for the months to come, not necessarily in, in Latin America, but on a global basis? Sure, I, I think, just in aggregate, um, you know, we often use liquidity or the word liquid as a metaphor uh, to explain financial market performance. Um, and if I take that one step further, what do liquids do in the physical world? They follow the path of least resistance. And so in the near term, my guess is markets continue to fall, take the path of least resistance, given the level of stimulus, given where real yields are, given where nominal yields are, and just generic sentiment and, and attitude. However, um, markets are a discounting mechanism of the future. And it's not when central banks taper or raise rates it's when the market thinks they will and so that day or that event will happen and when it does it'll happen faster than i think it has in the past mm -hmm. right when you think back to what we had during the lockdown in equity markets were down you know 30 percent in in weeks it used to be our world our financial world a stock market um, now it's a market of stocks. 
So the basketization of our industry has created just massive flooding. So near term, they'll do what they probably have done, but longer term, uh, I think investors need to be really thoughtful about the compensate the low level of compensation for what I think is a high level of risk. Well, thank you very much, Rob. Thank you, uh, Luca. So I think that we are uh, intellectually equipped now to build robust portfolio for the, the year <laughs> 21. <laughs> so I would like also to uh, to thank all the attendees for uh, their participation today and uh, and the relevance of their questions. So I think it's time to give back the floor to Laura. Thank, thank you, you Luca. Much. Thank you, Rob thank you. and Stefan. Obrigada a todos que participaram desse painel. Aproveito para mencionar que em parceria com a PICT, nós distribuímos o, no, no BTG Digital o fundo Global Mega Trend Selection, fundo de ação global focado em mega tendências Em parceria com a MFS, nós distribuímos o fundo Prudent Capital, que aplica seus recursos em títulos, de, é, títulos globais de renda variável e de renda fixa, utilizando uma abordagem de retorno total. Lembrando que amanhã teremos o segundo dia da nossa conferência, e o tema será investimentos alternativos, às 10 da manhã. Obrigada e até amanhã.